Hello and welcome back. In today's video, you're going to learn the design of reinforced concrete columns using ACI 318. In this example, we will design a column with a square cross section. As you can see in the example here, it is given that design a square tight column to support an actual death load of 130 kilopounds and a live load of 180 kilopounds. Assume that the compressive strength of concrete is 4,000 pounds per square inch and the yield strength of the steel is 60,000 pounds per square inch. So let's jump right in and go through the step-by-step -step process of designing reinforced concrete columns. The step number one in here is understanding this general formula from ACI 3ET. As you can see, the number of the formula is 10.2 in the ACI code and it's given us the maximum nominal load times the fee in here which is 0.65 for tight columns and this number is 0.75 for spiral columns which means that if the stirrups are connected and tied in a spiral way the compressive strength of the column will be higher compared to a tight column where the stirrups or connected or installed not in a spiral way. As you can see in the formula here, we have the ultimate load or phi times the nominal load, which equals to 0.8 times phi times 0.85 compressive strength of concrete times the gross section area of the concrete column minus the area of the steel plus the yield strength of the steel times the area of the steel. So in here, as we know, we have the compressive strength of concrete given, and besides that, we know the yield strength of the steel, which was given in the example. What we have to calculate is to obtain the value for the ultimate load and the value for the gross sectional area, and besides that, to calculate the area of the steel required to support the loads exerted on the column. So we'll go to the first step, which is calculating the ultimate load. As we know, usually the load is 1.2 times dead load plus 1.6 times live load. This combination of forces usually dominate, except for situations where wind or earthquake or any other factors might be of higher amounts. Only then we want to use this combination and the combination which results and the highest amount of the force will be used in our calculations. Since we had the dead load to be 130 kilopounds and the live load to be 180 kilopounds, this will result into 444 kilopounds. The next step is to determine the dimensions of the column. Since it's a square column, we have two dimensions called AB if it's rectangular, but if it's a squared column, both of the dimensions will be the same. The dimensions of the column's cross-sectional area is directly proportional to the load exerted on the column or the ultimate load PU shown in here and the compressive strength of the concrete. So the higher the load, the more the cross-sectional area of a column is required. In addition to that, if we increase the compressive strength of the concrete, the cross-sectional area will be reduced. If the compressive strength of the concrete is decreased, the cross-sectional area of the concrete required to support the loads will be increased. Since we have a square column, so both of the sides will be A. From here, we can understand that the gross area of the column section will be A times A or A square. The formula that I'm going to show in here is not a formula given in the books or the codes, but it's an empirical formula. And in the most of the cases when you're designing column sections in real life, this formula might help you. But make sure to check it with other factors in order for your column to be safe and stable against the load that are being applied throughout its useful life. In order to obtain the area of the column, we can use this formula as the ultimate load divided by 60% of the concrete's compressive strength. So in here, as we had, again, I'm mentioning this is not a formula given in your books or ACI code, 
But for the initial dimensions and for the initial assumptions, it can help you immeasurably in your real life problems of civil engineering. So from here, we can go and calculate the gross sectional area of the column to be 444 kilopounds divided by 0.6 times 4,000 pounds per square inch, which was the compressive strength of concrete. By changing this kilopounds in the top here to pounds and then dividing it on this 0.6 times 4,000, we will obtain the area required to be 196 inches square. Once we take the square root of this number, the side length will be 14 inches. So basically the column required will be 14 inches into 14 inches. Once we have the dimensions, the next step is to calculate the steel area based on the formula given in the ACI code. From here, as you can see, the number that we know right now are the compressive strength of concrete, the gross sectional area of the column, and the yield strength of steel. The only thing missing in here is the steel area. We have to evaluate those numbers in its places and that way we will obtain the area of the steel. Once we go to the next step and simplify this, the ending result will be something like this. So by performing some basic addition and subtraction in here, we can obtain that 187,446 equals to 56,600. I have not written down the units in here, but if you're doing it for your exam or doing a real life design, make sure to write down all the units. But here for simplicity, I will not write them down. From here, the required steel area will be 3.31 inches square. In the next step, we are going to find the number of the steel bars required. We will select number seven steel bars. The diameter of number seven steel bar will be seven divided by eight, which will give us the diameter in inches. In order to obtain its area, the formula for area will be pi times diameter square divided by four. From here, we can obtain the area to be 0.6 inch square per bar. Since we require 3.31 inches square, we will divide 3.31 inches square divided by 0.6, which is the area of a single bar, this will give us 5.5 bars. So what we will have to do is we'll use six bars. This will give us symmetry in the section. And besides that, that is more realistic because we cannot use half of a bar inside a concrete element section. So in here, we will use six number seven bars. The next thing is to calculate the spacing of our ties or stirrups. The diameter of the stirrup is taken to be number three bars, for which the diameter will be three divided by eight, which will give us the diameter in inches. The spacing between the stirrups should be the smallest of these numbers, out of which number one is 48 times the diameter of ties. Since we used number three bars in here, so the diameter will be three divided by eight times 48, which will give us 18 inches, or 16 times the diameter of the main bars, which were number seven bars. This will give us 14 inches, or the smallest side of the column, which was 14 inches again. We will take the spacing between the stirrups to be 14 inches. But bear in mind that the stirrups are used to support the shear forces exerted on the column. So they mainly work in case of an earthquake and other dynamic loading acting from one side of the building. The spacing between the stirrups are usually closer at the supports and are far away in the midway between the column. The reason is that at the supports, the shear is higher, while in the middle, the shear almost becomes zero. Another thing that you need to consider for spacing your steel bars, whether it's stirrups or main bars, is the coarse aggregate size. So steel bars should never be closer to each other than the maximum aggregate size that you're using. Or even we will multiply the diameter of an aggregate, coarse aggregate size into one and a half in order to obtain the minimum spacing that we can use between the bars. For this specific example, we will take 14 inches based on the criteria from these three options. The last thing is to do the detailing. So first of all, you will draw the cross section of the column 
based on the scale that you're using. So both of the sides will be 14 inches into 14 inches. Next thing is to draw your main bores in here, the six number seven bores that we had. And after that, we are going to draw the stirrups. Next thing is to write down the specifications and the spacing of each of these elements shown in our drawings. So number one, we are going to show the clear cover. For clear cover, as you can see, the section 20.6 of the ACI code provides specific guidelines for providing the clear cover in different concrete elements. So if, if you were interested to go into detail in that topic, you can go to this section and read more about the clear covers. Mainly the clear cover is to make sure that the steel bores are safe from the weather conditions outside. Next thing is that we need our main bores, which we have used six number seven bores. And last but not least is the stirrups, which in here, as you can see, I have written down number 14, but it is number three bores, which is a mistake in my presentation. So it's number three bores used at 14 inches center to center. I hope you have found the content of the video helpful. If you did so, consider subscribing to the YouTube channel and following us on Instagram and LinkedIn. Thank you very much for watching.